Um, yeah, this this talk is kind of a fun a fun thing, and I hope you'll enjoy it too. Um, the uh, now the Paisa is is uh, familiar to most people in southwestern Illinois as as a school mascot, as a a tourist attraction on the Mississippi River, um, as uh, the name of a creek near Alton, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. The root of all of that goes back to uh, some paintings that were supposedly on the bluff that represent uh, some kind of mythological creature. Now, the general concept of that has been that that um, that there was this mythological flying monster uh, that somehow vaguely fit into North American Indian uh, uh, stories and that um, that's about where it stops. So for a long time, there's been a lot of stories about this. Now, as Doug said, I, I was down in North Carolina not so long ago. I was busily writing my dissertation on a completely unrelated subject, and I there, I took the time to go listen to a, a speaker, a really fairly well-known uh, archaeologist who who uh, is well published on on uh, iconographies on the images of prehistoric art in North America. And as I sat and listened to him, he finally came across the Piasa, and I was listening, and I thought, whoa, he doesn't know that. And then I thought, oh, he doesn't know that. And pretty soon I thought, i got to write something on this because there's too many things that I knew that other people didn't know and that hadn't been published, and they still haven't been published, which I don't really want to talk about right now. <laughs> But um, anyway, I, so I stopped right in the middle of this, and I, I put together a talk with uh, Vin Stepanitis there uh, on campus and, and, and put together a talk that he gave at SEAC while I returned to scribbling my dissertation as fast as I could, uh, something that everybody who does a dissertation knows what, what that felt like. So anyway, um, and then I... After, after that talk was done, and when I came up here, I, I started giving this as a talk, but I enlisted a couple more authors. I pulled in uh, Michael McCafferty over at Indiana University and David Costa, and, and Michael's an expert in French period maps, and, uh, and both Michael and David are the preeminent experts on the Miami, Illinois language. So I've got a two-part talk called Untangling the Piasaw's Tale, a pun, obviously, on the long tail that, that wraps around the, the figure. Uh, and uh, There we go. All right, so all of this goes back, at least in the historic part of this, it all goes back to the visit of... Uh, Louis Joliet and, and Jacques Marquette, Father Jacques Marquette, at the, uh, to, to the Mississippi River in the summer of 1673. So th whenever anybody talks about this, I go back to this description. Um, they have, uh, this is from Marquette's journal. Uh, they have eyes as large as a calf, horns on their head like those of a deer, a horrible look, red eyes, beard like a tiger's, face somewhat like a man's, a body covered in scales and so long a tail that it winds around the body passing above the head and going back between the legs ending in a fish tail green red and black are the three colors composing the picture so this is a painting that they saw not of one creature but two uh, and they were near the water line on the on the, the bluffs uh, of the mississippi river so the points that i want you to remember about this is this composite creature Horns, beard, face, scales, long tail, which ends in a fish's tail. The other thing that's worthy of note about this description, the original description of these paintings, is there was no image in Marquette's journal. There is, he gives it no name, and that there were no wings. So already we have a little bit of a discrepancy. The discrepancy comes in clear back in 1836 when the Alton native John Russell popularized the idea of this Piasaw bird. He published an account of, of uh, what he said was a supposed Illinois Indian tale 
um, which in which the flying monster called the Piasaw uh, went through went uh, did went through certain acts and then was was in in uh, point, painted on the bluffs uh, at Alton. So the, another thing to keep in mind here then is that every known image historically of the Piasaw as it's been projected post dates that 1836 publication. So very soon after that, the the uh, the notion caught on. This is the the era of the grand panoramas and the travel logs and and uh, travelers' accounts of of the unknown continent of North America and all of that. And so so there were um, both here and and abroad images paint uh, of of the uh, the scene at Alton and the the way the natives venerated the image, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, was was brought into the myth of the Piasaw bird as it gained traction and, and became more and more uh, uh, popular. Now, some say that the paintings themselves, the ones described by Marquette, uh, were destroyed very early. Others say that they were still around by the 1800s. There's very mixed reports on that. Um, the reconstructions that have resulted in the Piasaw as it is presented now date back about 140 years, 130 years, and um, you can see the continuities from the images that, that were made then. At the time, they said they were copying, copying the image as it was painted, but there was pretty good evidence that the image as it was painted had been was long gone, long before the the people that would have had a chance to see this. So these are these are going these images then were generated by Russell's 1836 story more than Marquette's uh, textual description. Now to archaeologists, people and 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 iconographers specifically aware of the the art of the uh, North American Indians for the last several thousand years. Marquette's description is completely transparent. This is this creature that that Marquette describes can't be anything except the creature that we call the underwater panther, and that image itself is is shown in in many different manifestations, all the way from um, the Great Lakes in North America, well down into South America. So this is. Uh, this is up at Pictured Rocks on, on uh, Lake Superior. This is a 1850s drawing by Winnebago Indians. Um, there's some basketry work that's more recent, a pot from the central Mississippi Valley, an earthwork in Ohio, a copper plate in the southeastern United States, and a gold image in, in, uh, in the Moche culture in South America. This is a stock image of of uh, North American and, and the, Amer the iconography of the Americas that, that there's no mistake about. So that's been known quite a while. And then um, about 40 years ago, to make things more complex, because we always do, the uh, archeologists who were organizing the, uh, the corpus, the body of, of North American iconography started referring to all of the different versions of the underwater panther and the underwater serpent and the as as uh, as piasaws and so they talked so what they did was they organized into this into what they called a protean super theme in other words a very basic general uh, concept that overarches everything in doing this uh, Phillips and Brown in 1978 were particularly comforted by the fact that there was no authentic image of of the creature that was called the Piasaw at at Alton. The lack of the image made it perfect for for creating an overarching thing that that include flying underwater panthers, um, uh, the the underwater serpent, man or uh, um, Human impersonators of underwater panthers and and actual quadrupeds with underwater panther images uh, uh, affiliations. So here's what the situation is. Then after the 1970s, was that Marquette's text had been added to the a 1770s place name 
that Russell used to describe what he said was an Illinois Indian story to create today's popular version of the Piasaw bird, that conglomerate concept of all of these underwater panthers is what I want to try and untangle tonight, even though some of these don't have a tail. To do that, I have to go through the two parts that I was describing, part one uh, and part two uh, on the front, front thing. So the, I want to talk about the place name, Piasaw, and the history of that, on, on mostly using, using maps. Uh, I want to straighten out this Illinois tribe tail, uh, which is so badly garbled that it was barely recognizable. But once I lay it out for you, I think you'll agree that there's not any doubt that that the that we did we have figured out what what the Illinois Indian tale was and how it applies here. I want to show that we now have an original drawing from the 1670s, and the pedigree of that is is verified as as relating to the drawing that Marquette had. It's lost these 300 years, or not lost, but lost in plain sight. And then I want to explore the name. The, the Illinois language uh, meaning of the word Piasaw. And then I want to uh, talk a little bit more about this Piasaw symbolism in time and space. It's extremely different than the concept of Piasaw as it's been uh, promoted these last 200 years. And then look at the implications for, for, for again, for iconography and for supernatural understanding of, of North American I uh, iconography of uh, and and what that means for our terminology, which isn't good. Okay, and while you're doing this, it, this is a, a long, it's not long, but it's complex to go through all of these. If you want to find out where you're at any time, you can look at these handy little little things that tell you where where you're at in the in the talk. So the place name. Now uh, the first map that shows the word Piasaw is a 1778 map by Patrick, I mean by, uh, by Hutchins. Uh, and uh, in, on it, it shows uh, the Missouri River coming in here, something called the Piasaws on the bluff here near Alton, a long chain of rocks here going on up into the Illinois River. And this came from a 1773 letter that, that Hutchins, Thomas Hutchins was in, in um, possession of by a man named Patrick Kennedy, who lived at Kaskaskia and making a trip up to the Illinois River. So in 1773, he said, the chain of rocks in the high hills, which began at the Piasaws, about three miles above the mouth of the Missouri, or above the Missouri, extend to the mouth of the Illinois. And then uh, about 20 years later, an exquisite detailed map by uh, Definials um, shows the same sort of thing. Here's the Missouri coming in here. Here's some bluffs. Uh, and then here's what's called Piasaw River, today's Piasaw Creek, Piasaw Island, and Piasaw Heights. Autours de Piasaw, the double L being pronounced as a Y then. So anyone who's driven, say from Grafton to Alton along the McAdams Highway has, has, has gone along the base of these bluffs that were called Hauteurs de Piasaw, across Piasaw Creek, past what's left of Piasaw Island, the bluffs above, above uh, Alton then being referred to as the Piasaws. So that's the place name history, and that's why it was available for, for, for to be adopted into this this story in 1836, but adopting it into the story was not not very accurately done. All right, now John Russell's 1836 account goes like this. Basically, uh, uh, there was a flying monster. He says that the Illinois Indian tale went like this. He said there was a flying monster named the Piasaw that had a taste for human flesh. It lived in one of these caves along this bluff and that many people were eaten, huge villages were decimated. This was an ongoing problem. Nobody know, knew what to do. Uh, and then until a great chief of the Illinois 
was instructed in a dream how to overcome the monster. Then we go through how he overcame the monster. The monster was vanquished, and the image was supposedly then put on the bluff to, to memorialize the event that took place there. That's the story as it's been handed down, but there's several problems. One of the problems was that anybody who looked into this couldn't find an Illinois Indian tale that matched this at all. In 2005, David Costa, as I say, the foremost expert on the Illinois language, published some accounts that this man, George Washington Finley, who is a Peoria Indian living in Oklahoma, had given to the Smithsonian Institution in 1895. So they sat there from 1895 until 2005, and then he, then he translated these accounts. Now what these accounts are tell a story not of an Illinois chief, but of a supernatural culture hero, one that we recognize over and over again as uh, being present over and over again, a, uh, a culture hero called Wisakachiqua, and in this case, the Illinois trickster. The trickster stories are found all through the mid-continent, and they go on and on, and basically you can conceive of a trickster as a supernatural being that taught people how to live the right way by not living the right way, by, by messing things up willfully over and over again and then having to serve the consequences and being killed and stuff like that because he's a supernatural being. In fact, he was the first being. But his, the stories, the morality stories of, of uh, Wisakachiqua or tricksters anywhere are based on the idea that they're instructing people how to live right because they show the consequences of not living right. Costa's translation of of the of this this Illinois Indian trail a uh, tale goes like this: Wisakachiqua runs into a Frenchman and they decide to go to the trading post and get and and get and so they get some furs and they dress the furs and then they set off in a boat for the trading post. Wisakachiqua is being himself, as he always is, incautious to the point of insanity. He's singing loudly. The Frenchman becomes afraid because he knows that they're near the, the home of the man-eater, the Manitou. Wisakachiqua doesn't listen to these warnings. He keeps, keeps on singing, and then their boat is sucked into the lair of the Manitou. So what they find when they get in there is that there's a lot of people in there, and they're all captive. The, uh, they're being steadily eaten by the Manitou, and that Wisakachiqua acts unafraid. He just walks around it like he's in the trading post and says, how much for this? How much for that? And, and uh, just sort of goes through all of this. The, uh, the Manitou ignores him, and then after the Manitou eats a few people, he goes to sleep. And then Wisakachiqua loads him up with gunpowder gets all the people out of the lair, and with a gunpowder and a rag, he explodes the Manitou. Then the water at that location supposedly boils for many years. Wisakachiqua then takes over the, un the underwater lair of, of the, uh, the Manitou as his home, and he's living there for many years. And then one day when he's sunning on the rocks outside of this, this he... Um, sees off in the distance he sees two figures coming and he realizes that they are the twin the underwater dwarfs who are malevolent creatures that were coming to attack him so they get close they start shooting at him and uh he says wait a minute wait a minute if you want the den just say so and they say we want it and he says okay you can have it so he gives them the den and after that their name, oh, by the way, their name is Payasaki. After that, the Payasaki live in the, in, the, in the home of the underwater panther, the underwater monster, and you can still see their footprints there. So that's how it ends with this reference to you can still see their footprints there. So this, this is very different, but clearly linked to the story that, that, uh, that Russell told. Russell talks about the protagonist is a great chief, and the main action figures in Finley 1895's Peoria tale is, a, is the Wisakachiqua, the culture hero, a supernatural, a timid Frenchman, who is actually the only human in the story, 
the underwater panther, which is well known in, as the Manitou, and these twin dwarf supernaturals, the Piasaki, which are malevolent. The, uh, the action, the location in Russell's tale is a cave on the bluff, but the location here is an underwater lair. And this is shown and this is reflected by the fact that the boat was sucked into it as they were traveling on the river. Plus, that's where underwater panthers live. So in, in Russell's 1836 story, this is a specific location called the Piasaws. But in Finley, this is a location, a generalized location. It's repeated over and over and over again across the mid-continent, someplace with the swirling rivers, turbulent waters, rocks, etc. So where you might have caves and lairs, and etc. So now we have the tale that this refers to. So let's go back to Marquette. Let's, let's talking about the original image. Marquette was really impressed with this image. Not surprisingly, somebody drew it, but but that image never showed up in the records. I had several lines of evidence. I'm going to tell you why. The um, in the original 1873 description was made after Marquette and Joliet left uh, the uh, the Straits of Mackinac in the summer of 1673. They came down through Green Bay, up the Fox River to near its headwaters, portaged into the Wisconsin River down the Wisconsin to the Mississippi, which they called the River de la Concepcion, down the Mississippi. And the first people really that they ran into after they left the portage in Wisconsin was the Peoria, who were then living at the mouth of the Des Moines River. In recent decades, we found that Peoria village. There's been good excavations there. It's called Illinois Village, and, uh, and it's, near, it's on the terrace near the, the mouth of the Des Moines River. They came on down the river after spending an appropriate amount of time with the Peoria. The Peoria tried to dissuade them from going on down the river, told them tor terrible stories of all the awful people they were going to meet. But basically, they just didn't want the French to go past them. They wanted the French to keep coming back and forth and bringing goods so that they were the ones who were redistributing. They don't really want the, the, the French to go past them. But anyway, the, the, the Joliet and Marquette expedition did go on down the stream. They went down. Um, here's the mouth of the Illinois, at, just past the mouth of the Illinois, and just, just above the uh, mouth of the Missouri River, they described these paintings. They went on down to Arkansas. Then they did start getting worried by all the tales that were being told, but this is, in this case, it was the tales of how close they were to the Spanish, and they knew that if they were captured by the Spanish, that the expedition was a failure. So they turned around, they came back up, they went past the Piasaws again, they went into the Illinois River, because this is the upstream route. Here's the basics of, of travel in the 17th century, probably any time before that, too. Mississippi's a nice downhill route, a current maybe five, six miles an hour, braided stream environment. The Illinois is 230 miles of flat, straight, deep river. So if you're going to the Great Lakes, going upstream, you go through the Illinois River. Um, anyway, they, they came back up. They went to the Kaskaskia village, which is near what's now called Starved Rock, also called, known as the Zimmerman site to archaeologists. Stayed there a while. Marquette promised to come back. Then they went up into Lake Michigan, back to the, to the Straits of Mackinac for the winter. So that's the winter after the summer of 1673. While they're up there, Marquette finishes his journal and prepares to go back to start the mission, first mission in Illinois, at the grand village of the Kaskaskia. Joliet, who was really the leader of this expedition, working under the orders of the, of the governor of New France, um, spent his winter at Mitchell and Mackinac making complete duplicates of all of his material. He's a good, a good explorer. He knew what the expedition was expected to achieve. And, and he put it all in a storehouse there at Mitchell and Mackinac. Then the summer of 74, Marquette went back down um, to, to Kaskaskia, actually got there, started the mission, and on his way back north, he died. 
um, Joliet and the rest of the expedition went down to Montreal through the Great Lakes. When they were within sight of Montreal, they came to the giant rapids that were then known as the St. Louis Rapids. Today they're known as the Lachine Rapids. And the rapids are the reason Montreal is where it is, because you can take a ship up to Montreal, but you can't go any further because of the rapids. So the St. Lawrence goes through these cataracts and stuff there. And the, then when the Marquette, I mean, when the Joliet expedition came to these rapids, they went into the rapids and they turned over. They lost everything. Um, Joliet lost two of his men who drowned, all of their records, all of their materials, everything in the way of original records for the expedition that was meant to discover the mid-continent. And, um, and so that, there you have it. So, um, now I don't know exactly what it would be like to, to, uh, work for the, work for the governor of New France, but I can imagine, I can sort of channel what it would be like working for my boss, <laughs> who, who would say, heard you had a rough day yesterday, lost a couple guys in the rapids, uh, gonna need that report next week. <laughs> So here's Joliet. He's back from the voyage of discovery. He's got nothing. And so they assign him. Well, I'll get to that story in a second. So that then Joliet went ahead and he made a map and he did his report as best he could. And I'll get to the, the nuts and bolts of that that explain that. But there was another mystery that has never been solved. On another, a later map, Nobody knows how much later, by a man named Jean-Baptiste Franklin, uh, labeled the map of the Mississippi with no date, there is what's transparently evident to archaeologists as an underwater panther right here. This is the modern day location of Alton, Missouri River, Illinois River going over to the Lake of the Illinois. Wisconsin River uh, and the Muscoutin Village and the Fox River and Green Bay, et cetera. So nobody's ever been able to try and to, to put this together. This was noticed as early as Parkman, 1889. Uh, Grace Newt talked about it. William Martin talked about it in 1963. Jerry Jacobson tried to put all this together in 1991, but they couldn't come up with the link. Why? What is the pedigree? What's the the origination of this, this uh, underwater panther on this map uh, of, uh, of the mid-continent. So, so this is called the, the, um, the Franklin map of the Mississippi, undated. About, uh, I forget what year it is now. Okay, so 20 years ago, Ray Wood, uh, who's a, a mapping expert of, uh, in, in, in North America, um, the center of North America especially, was going to put together another folio of maps to join the, the sets of, fol of maps that the Illinois State Museum had accumulated over the decades. He asked me what he should do, what, what was really a great, what were the good mysteries to work on. And I told him that this Franklin map with this piezole was one of the central mis mysteries of the Joliet and Marquette era and, and should be figured out. The result of his investigation into that was a, a chart of how these things supposedly work out. And to do that, he went to a, a man, a Jesuit priest named Jean de Langlais, who had assembled all the evidence he could. Everyone knew Joliet's famous map. He said the originals are lost in the Lachine Rapids. Joliet had made a 1674 map, which everyone took to be Joliet's main map. But everything else derived from not Joliet's map. So they hypothesized this Joliet lost map. And so for the last 80 years, this Joliet lost map has been a key part of, of the understanding of how these maps evolved. And, and clear down here, the, Joliet, the Franklin map uh, of the Mississippi which uh, these guys figured out must date to 1678, 1679, but they're not really sure. And so this was published in 2001. Uh, I had some articles in here too, but not on this subject. 
But what neither Ray Wood nor I knew was that in 1992, a, a Jesuit priest in Montreal named Lucien Campo had published an article which translate, he published it only in French, which helped us not know about it, or at least gave us a little bit of a pass on, on not knowing about it. The translation of the title of the article is the maps relative to the, the maps relative to the discovery of the Mississippi by fathers Jacques Marquette and Louis Joliet. What Campo did was turn this whole sequence on its head. He says, yeah, there's a Joliet 1674 map. There's no lost map at all. There's another map uh, by Joliet, and then, then he, so the first map is this one that he called Joliet 1674 map. He calls Colbertet. Joliet made a second map with Franklin in 1675 that he called the Frontenacy. And then finally, Joliet and uh, Franklin made a map in 1676 to 1678, somewhere in there called the map of the Mississippi. That's the one with the Pius. So there were three Joliet maps. So these maps then work. You sort of have to go through the stage, just like I was imagining Tom wanting his report of the discovery of the Mississippi. I, you have to go through the stages of each of these to figure out what happened. So. The first stage is working without any information. Frontenac, Governor Frontenac says, got to have that report. And Joliet has nothing. So what's he do? Well, Joliet had been working with the Jesuits. Frontenac hated Jesuits. He had just been appointed governor. It was, uh, showed up in New France too late to cancel the, the Marquette uh, and Joliet expedition because they were affiliated with Jesuits. And he would have canceled it and handed it to the Sulpicians, the different branch of the Catholic Church, if he'd been there a little bit earlier. But it's too late. These guys were taking off as he took office. So they took off and they came back. So when they didn't have a map at all, what they did was they took a copy of... Uh, hmm. They took a copy of a map that Marquette had made with another priest named... Uh, Alloway in about five years before this, called uh, Lake Tracy or Superior, which mapped the northern part of Lake, Lake Michigan and all of Lake Superior in exquisite detail. It's a wonderful map. These Jesuits knew how to make maps. And so they took that and they just sort of hung the rest of the discovery on it. The notable feature of this is all of, these, all of this map has no detail. No, we saw a village here, we did this here, we did the, we talked to those people there. It, this whole lower map is empty. And then there's this long description here. And basically what Joliet says in this description is you wouldn't believe how cool this was. We went here and we saw all these people and we saw these things. And basically when you read through the whole description, he says... Oh my God, the dog ate the homework. <laughs> so this is the map that he gave Frontenac immediately after returning back from the voyage of discovery. And down here in the corner, he signs it, your most humble and obedient servant, Joliet. So, and he calls, he calls this land in the mid-continent, the Colbertet, and after one of the main ministers that they were all working for. Then what must have happened is something like Frontenac saying, you clowns, <laughs> where's my report? And, and um, so then what happened was um, they needed, let me back up a second here. Basically, the message then was that, okay, it's the summer of 1674. They just lost everything. But... Look, Governor, don't worry. Every, there's copies of everything. We left copies of everything at Michilimackinac, and it'll come down next summer, during the summer of 75. It'll come down. Everything will come down. It'll all be good, and we'll have your discovery for you then. Fine. Go away. Come back next summer. Um, bring me the, the broom of the wicked witch, as so to speak. So 
Um, so the next summer comes, word comes down uh, from Montre or from from the Straits of Mackinac. Well, here's Marquette's journal. By the way, he's dead. Here's his map. Um, but your stuff you, that you left in that storeroom, it burned down. It's all gone. So now they're desperate. So now they go. They make a new, Joliet makes a new map, and this time his map has the information from jo, from Marquette's map on it. It reflects a lot of this, the villages, who they saw, what they went, where they went. And now, just to show how desperate they are, they name it La Frontenacy. So now that's directly for the governor. It's like, we named this whole place after you. So, because Joliet was very open in, the, in, his, in his writings that he hoped to be the governor of all of this new land. Frontenac clearly wasn't impressed. And by then, he, has, he had the excuse he needed to cancel this whole operation, go find Jean Cavalier, uh, Sir de La Salle, and say, guess what? You're going to go conquer the Mid-Continent for me, which is what he did like two years later. So Joliet's 19, uh, 1675 map became the map that everyone associates, along with the Marquette map, with the expedition. Even more so because the Marquette maps disappeared in 1763, and no one saw it again for, um, well, well over 100 years. And then they found it in a, in a, uh, a monastery. It, it disappeared during the, the English invasion of Montreal, when Montreal fell to the English. This map in 1675, he also signed, your most humble and obedient servant. Uh, he signed it with one L, Joliet, just to show you that these things vary. Now, so Joliet's out of a job. He has no more hopes. John Baptist Franklin, who was like 22 years old at this time, gets his appointment to, to as the, the main cartographer for New France, and he's becoming increasingly important, but he's not really, they're not in the same position they were politically. There's no Curry, no favor to Curry. The thing was lost. It was already been, going to be handed to La Salle. So they make this map, and it's much more polished, much more detailed, engraved. Uh, and just to show you that typos are forever, they named the name of the map is a general map of northern France, containing the discovery of the country of the Illinois. So it's supposed to be New France, but they messed that up. Anyway, this is the map published about three years after the expedition that has the underwater panther on it at Alton. So this underwater panther is on a map signed by Joliet. I forgot to show you that, but same thing. A map of northern France uh, um, containing the discovery of the country of the Illinois, Monsieur Joliet. So this is either a literal copy of an image that was with the Marquette Journal and got lost subsequently, or this is a map, at least, of Joliet's sanctioned map, because it's his map, just Franklin made it, uh, that says, here's what we saw at this place. So this is the image of the, the drawings of what they saw, and which is no surprise at all. It's an underwater panther. So where'd the Piasaw bird come from? First of all, then, so I need to go through the language stuff. Uh, John Russell said that Piasaw in the Illinois language, uh, actually one of the earliest word uses of the word Illini to, to describe the Illinois, says this, that the word means the bird that devours men. Yeah, he made that up. <laughs> there's, there's no basis for it whatsoever. In, in uh, 1956, Wayne Temple, with the, uh, then with the Illinois State Museum, eventually with the Illinois State Archives, looked into this. Usually Temple uh, did a really fairly good job and messed up really critical things once in a while, and he messed this up. He said Jacob Pyatt Dunn, who was at that time, or previous to that time, the main expert on the Illinois-Miami language, said that there's no such word as Piasaw in the Illinois language. And he also said they looked into it and they talked to the Peoria and stuff and 
and Dunn, Jacob Pyatt Dunn says that the legend isn't in keeping. Well, it wasn't in keeping. We've seen that already. We've seen that the, the legend that, that the Peoria had was very different than the story that, that Russell told. So um, then David Costa in 2005 looked at this. He said, Jacob Pyatt Dunn, a different manuscript than the one Temple looked at, says that the Illinois-Miami word Piasaw means a small supernatural being. Uh, and in that dictionary, it's someone who guided departed ser ser uh, spirits into the next world. In the Peoria story, the Piasaki are malevolent twin dwarfs, still small beings then. Costa concludes then that the Illinois-Miami word is clearly the origin of the word Piasa, but it's still got nothing to do with the underwater panther. So uh, Costa also noted, he said the word, the same word, Piasa, is, is uh, present in a, a, different, a different Illinois French language dictionary found just a few years ago, actually by McCafferty. And he says that it, it's not really defined there, but it's in a list of supernatural beings. And that the dwarfs, the Piasaki and Finley's tale, have their parallel in other things. We've seen these guys before. We just didn't know they were part of this Piasa story. And then he says the monster, the, the Manitou, much more likely the underwater panther, which in the Illinois language is Aramin, Aramapincia. So... We've got a big mix-up. I want to turn your attention to the the last of the uh, of the story um, of, in which they said that you can still see the dwarfs took over the cave and uh, the the underwater lair, and you can still see their footprints there. As it turns out, among the rock art of of the central part of North America, footprints are not uncommon. And also not uncommon is for these footprints to have three, four, six, seven toes, sometimes five also. But in general, this odd number of, of toes is probably an indicator that this is a supernatural being, some sort of a, a, a built-in code that shows that this is. So these, these footprints are often in association with other things that are rep. Uh, uh, recognizes underwater symbols, these, these little uh, uh, bisected angles that have been referred to sometimes as turkey tracks, but they always seem to have some sort of underwater associations. These, uh, these circles and circles within circles have been uh, connected over and over again to the scales of the underwater panther. And then locationally, uh, in the rock art of Missouri, uh, Carol Diaz Granados and Jim Duncan have said that these things tend to f always be found along watercourses, on rock near watercourses, and these they say it must mean something. So this is, this whole thing started really ni coming together nicely about 2005, but all the pieces weren't self-evident. So we can see footprints on this 2,000-year-old pot with these water symbols on it from Havana, Illinois, a middle woodland pot. We have uh, um, a 1,000 AD um, figurine of some sort with six toes that was found underneath a borrow pit at Cahokia Mounds. And the, the general gist of this is, yes, yeah, these, these footprints are often, often in some place where the underwater panther might be, rushing water, deep turbulent pools, rock. So being an obsessive kind of person, I went and found all the footprints that I could find. And what I found was, was indeed this pattern held very nicely. These are always along water courses. They're especially common in the mid-continent. And they're, they're often associated with other kind of under, underworld symbolism. There's a special concentration here in southwestern Illinois. This is... Um, this is the, the uh, Alton Piasaw region, um, not nearly. Of, of course, these tend to be found where there's rock to scribe them on, of course, in the first place. But, uh, and then, then these prehistoric examples down here, I mean, it's all prehistoric, but these are Mississippian period, Kincaid, uh, Cahokia. 
And so that that adds some some distributional understanding to what how the breadth and depth in time and space of of the uh, the association between these twin dwarfs and the underwater panther as this broadly understood tail across the, the mid continent. To top all this all off, things often work out really nicely. In the summer of 2012, just a few months before I uh, started on this, I got word that in the Illinois Valley, somebody had found a, uh, a rim shirt. Now this is a, what, what I call Mossville phase rim shirt. It dates to about 1000 AD, same time as that foot at uh, Cahokia. And it shows two figures. It shows, it shows, it shows us a human figure here but it's a diminutive human. It's a little little thing standing between two other things. So there's these arms reaching in that look just like these, which if we just blow that up and make it big, there's a big person, a little person, and something standing here. Here's the feet. And there's this box. And the only other use of this box that we've seen is this, this quadruped with this box with these two forks coming out of it, or this fork line coming out of it. The rest of the iconography of, of this Maples Mills Mossville pottery includes constant refer references to the upper world and the, un and the lower world. So we've got an underwater panther sitting up with the see the fork tail, the tail like a fish, uh, a thunderbird underwater symbol here, uh, a falcon impersonator, and again another underwater panther with a human head and fork tail, etc. So. This, this kind of polarity holds. So what's this little guy? Well, I think it's a dwarf. I, I guess it's, I think it's altogether too fortuitous, but it's interesting that that um, that this, this small figure uh, fits into this kind of polarity somehow. It's, it makes sense that it's this dwarf if you're willing to extend these things over a thousand years. Obviously, I am. So going back to what Costa said, he said, Although Jacob Pyatt Dunn once defined the Illinois Miami Piasaw as small supernatural, in the Peoria story they're malevolent creatures. We see this association over and over again. Here's the underwater panther's tail on rock art. Here's some footprints. And uh, so we've got one other problem. Every archaeologist in North America, or at least in the mid continent, refers to Underwater panthers now as piasaws. We got to stop that because <laughs> piasaw very clearly means supernatural dwarfs. So in in essence, so what we've done is take a three hundred and forty year detour with with the iconography with the with from the from the uh, the first description, the first historic description of this to find out something that you could have asked anybody who lived in Illinois what this meant in 1673, and they could have told you. So that's that. Thank you.